webinar on workplace culture. Now, I'd like to introduce Ray Biggs, our president and CEO. Ray has been West Shore Bank's leader for the past 11 years and has worked in the banking industry for 30. Ray has extensive experience in commercial banking and lending with proven skills in acquisition and integration, as well as driving new business development. Ray is currently serving as the chairman of the Michigan Bankers Association Service Corporation Board of Directors, chairman of the Bank Management Committee. He is also currently serving as director as a director on the Michigan Chamber of Commerce Political Action Committee Board of Directors. Please join me in welcoming Ray Biggs. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second educational webinar offered by West Shore Bank. Um, as a community bank, we're always looking for ways to give back to the areas in which we serve. Uh, this year, uh, we decided to launch a series of webinars providing information on several topics uh, that we work through as a bank and that we think will add value to many local businesses and certainly uh, those in our communities. Uh, today's topic is near and dear to my heart uh, at West Shore Bank. It's focusing on efforts to elevate organizational culture to attract, inspire, and grow our employees. Uh, that's, a, that's a key initiative for us uh, every day that we, that we work through. Uh, we know that if we can create an engaging workplace environment, we'll increase productivity and ultimately enhancing that customer experience where everybody feels valued. And when I mean everybody feels valued, it's not only our customers, but also the employees. Um, I'm excited to introduce and, and certainly interview our subject matter expert today, Roxanne Emmerich. Roxanne is a uh, serial entrepreneur uh, and CEO of Emmerich Group, a, a consulting firm whose client list features many top performing companies in America. Uh, we're also a client, obviously. Uh, she possesses a remarkable ability to create immediate and sustainable business results by uh, engaging workforces, leading them through that transformational process and finding that uh, cultural transformation. Uh, employees become wildly committed to delivering you know, really unique experiences for our customers, uh, gr growth, greater accountability, and, and certainly focusing on outcomes and, and accountability. She's the New York Times best-selling author of Thanks, Thank God It's Monday, which it's hard for people to say, but it does work. Uh, and is a popular guest expert on CNN, Fox, and other business channels. Welcome, Roxanne. Thanks, Ray. It is so good to be here. And you guys are the example of great culture. So I'm so glad that we're doing this together. Thank you so much. Well, um, thanks for joining. Everything, uh, everything good on your end um, with um, all, all the things that we're facing these days, all the challenges. I know it's been a, it's been an interesting time for everybody as everybody is striving to become um, you know, a better workplace uh and and create culture um i do know that you know as as we work through some of the some some of the uh, the training that we do with you we've looked at some of the gallup information that was really a kicking off point for us right and and then doing a survey of our folks and then and then learning that 70 to 80 percent of the employees are disengaged in companies which is startling astounding um because i i think that if you were to ask any ceo that they would come up with a, a very different number, that they would say that it's, you know, the vast majority and it's a very small group of people that really need to be helped up over the wall. But um, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, is that is that really, is that a real number? Is that true? Is that big of a number? Well, they keep coming up with it year after year after year. And so uh, there's gotta be something to that. But the really remarkable part, Ray, is um, the research shows that for every $10,000 of payroll, if you have an average amount of, of culture going on in your organization, $3,400 is lost from the bottom line. And I'm thinking that's real money. Um, and so if you look at pretty much any company, you look at their payroll and take 34% of it and bring that back down to the bottom line, it's a game changer. So getting a culture of people who are on fire, who know how they tie to profit on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, um, who are, are knocking off on, on all the uh, adult day, daycare kind of behaviors that, that, you know, where they're whining and complaining and gossiping and doing all those things that just slow everything down so you can't do real work. Those things are in the way and, and we don't and we have no time for nonsense right now. This is an interesting economy. It's about to get more interesting. Uh, we got we got to get about the real stuff. Yeah, you know, when I, I think about um, certainly community banking, we, and we see an awful lot of, you know, in the bank M&A space, we see a lot of cultures coming together and transforming and it creates opportunities for us. But as as we see that culture change with larger banks, um, we're, we're trying to we're, we're always trying to adapt and improve our culture and and certainly find that way to earn your independence. 
right? Because all this bank M&A, banks are going away, and we feel very strongly about serving our communities. We know that culture will play an important role, but it's some, that's something you can touch or feel. Um, so maybe explain a little bit about, you know, how do you put your arms around this kind of invisible topic, but it's critically important. Okay, well, first of all, I want to say something about community banking, and that is I've seen so often, Ray, that when the last community bank leaves a community, you get the brain drain, the small businesses dry up, because I remember during the last recession how the big banks send out the massive amount of letters saying, we no longer have an appetite for your type of loan, pay up in 30 days. Uh, well, when, when these businesses most needed to have somebody have their back, their big bank was gone. So um, so that's why I'm a real firm believer, and I'm so thrilled with what, you, what you're doing both of your culture and what, what you're doing to support in your community. But as it applies to culture, it's just an important thing that we all have to learn how to figure out how to do. And, you know, the problem is in school, nobody teaches you culture. Um, and so you learn finance and you learn, learn marketing, but, but, uh, but culture is a series of systems that helps people tie to the values of your organization, the behaviors of your organization, the outcomes of your organization, the alignment is an important piece. And so it's one thing to say, rah, rah, let's get the troops all going the right direction. It's another one to get them there and to understand that, that culture is just a series of systems that are tied together that keeps advancing the, the, the um, abilities of people and gets them better aligned to the stuff that matters because humans being humans, we're all like, oh, look, a shiny thing. Oh, look, a squirrel. Uh, and so we're, uh, we, we are all busy. I, I always call it a four letter word, right? Uh, busy is the ultimate four letter word because whenever you go to somebody about the important work that needs to be done, they can't because they're busy with sorting those paper clips yet one more time by color um, and really justifying how overworked that they are. And I think a lot of people have lost themselves as we're going into this part of the, you know, pandem pandemic seems to be, you know, who, who knows what happens with that, but it did some damage to the souls of people and people are confused and they're lost and we need to bring them back. Yeah, well, when you mentioned that uh, and the bring it back, it, as, we, as we see more of our employees working in different places remotely, um, and and then coming back into the office, and, and I know that you know culture is an, it's a never ending process. Is what I've what I've come to the conclusion that you never stop. You're on this treadmill, and it doesn't have a stop button, which is okay. It's kind of part of the deal uh, to remain profitable and independent. Certainly, as a community bank and serve your communities, you have to view it as a never ending journey. You just have to work harder and harder at getting better at it. And make sure you have the right people to, uh, to help you make, remain relevant. Right. Um, but that's been very challenging for us uh, in the last 12 months and, 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 you know, doing everything, you know, via video, like, just like we are here today. Now we're adapting and, and some of this, I don't want to go, I don't want to give up because it's efficiency and communication and working with people. But maybe you could talk a little bit about, because I do think the workplace is going to permanently change a little. And is it going to make culture difficult or more difficult? It's going to require different things from it, Ray. So yes, um, they surveyed after people were sent home to work they were surveyed and 75% of them said, I'll never go back to an office again. So even though there are some people who have been told to come back to the office, they're busy looking for their jobs right now. So we gotta find some ways to maybe have someone coming in two, three days a week or not at all. And how do we tie it together? Here's the problem. The people who are working in the offices are, are thinking the people um, who are home are eating bonbons and watching soap operas and having just the best of times. Uh, and the people who are at home, according to the research, are actually working far more hours than they ever did back when, when they were in the office. So everybody thinks they got the wrong deal. And with that, Ray, we got a cultural problem, right? Um, I, I always loved that uh, uh, you um, the, the study that was done and it was in, in the uh, Business Week magazine where they interviewed 6,000 people and they asked them, do you perform in the top 10%? And uh, lo and behold, 90% of people believe that they perform in the top 10%. So if you do the math on that, uh, that is uh, not exactly possible. So uh, everyone seems to think they got the short stick. And as leaders and executives and owners, we have to figure out how to get these teams talking to each other, working through it, letting go of these biases, making visibility happen, and creating some ways for them to interact, have fun together, have play together, um, and, and reconnect, um, but also to have them see the progress the organization has made. So hands off is not gonna work in culture. You um, now, at least twice per day, your teams have to be on video, 
connecting and working through things together and your visibility boards, whether you're using a, a project management software or however you're keeping it visible, what needs to get done next and what's done will be more important than ever. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly been important for us to, um, to to work through that process of how we communicate with our employees and it's been challenging. It's not email doesn't work anymore. You know, it's video, it's everything. And right. um, and it seems like you've got to use all of the tools in the toolbox because you never know who you're going to reach and how you're going to reach them differently in that communication spectrum. Um, uh, even texting, uh, you know, something that, you know, certainly 15 years ago, I don't think I ever received a business text. Now I do more business via text um, mm -hmm. than, I, than I do in, in email. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the other, um, you know, I kind of want to bring this a little more into the small business owner and, and less about banking. It seems like every business faces a lot of uh, issues these days. They've got uh, they've got succession planning problems. We know that's a big issue, mm -hmm. right? We have it here at the bank. We're always talking about how do we hire the next person and, and where are we going to find them from and how are we going to move them in from out of market if they're not from here. Um, and we know our we know our business customers have the same issues. When you think about uh, the cyber attacks that we're all dealing with, and and we just dealt with this with a pipeline not too long ago. My guess is it'll be something else two weeks from now. These seems seem to be picking up steam. Um, and there's all these economic challenges and and uh, and finding people right now who want to work. I mean that's a big deal with some and and I know some of this stuff is uh, is temporary, but I think always finding good employees that want to work and want to participate and kind of all pull in the same direction is tricky. Any thoughts on that? Is, is there any um, you know because I think a lot of us, a, a lot of folks are always worried about their bottom line, which is important. And it's critical. And I think they they sometimes believe that working on culture is frivolous. It's not important. It's the softer part of the business. And really what I want to do is drive results. But we've learned you can't really drive results unless you have the right culture. So yeah. any thoughts on that as you deal with you know people throughout the US? Strong thoughts and feelings. Okay, so it has been proven that if you want to change the profitability and growth of your organization, the number one leading indicator of that is culture. Uh, number two is strategy. So sometimes you need to change the direction how you're doing it, but number one is strategy. And so we have to find ways around the fact that some people don't want to come back to work or they want to work from home or they want to, um, uh, but what we can't work around it anymore are the people who are just plain obstructionists. So the research shows that if you have even one person out of a team of 500 um, who is a pot stirrer and they're going around, around saying, do you hear that Ray Wanda has to do this? Can you believe that? And, and they're working harder against you than for you. Even one, uh, they, they show that all of your turnover can be sourced to that one person. So we just have no time for nonsense um, during times like this because you know those kind of people were accepted in the workplace before. It's kind of like, a, well, they, they've been miserable in their last job and the job before that and the job before that and they're on their fifth spouse. Um, and so nothing ever makes them happy. Oh, well, let's work around them. You know, now we're kind of better off without many of those because we need to have people around us that we can trust who are sincere and authentic and, and moving things through. And we have to grow them to be that. Now, not everyone will grow that way, right? Uh, and so it, it can it can take the horse to water, right? Uh, but, you can, but you can't stick their head in there and hold it there forever. And and so um, I love the fact. I know through our thank God it's Monday University um, that we have uh, we have the sandbox etiquette where we're teaching people how to be uh, in the workplace because their mamas didn't tell them these things, um, and so they're being disruptive and causing problems um, that are just not acceptable in the workplace. So the key here, we have to start with getting those fundamental ways of being down. And then we have to start showing them how to improve performance. I'm telling you, Ray, in the future, the small businesses that figure out how to be learning organizations and have people who are wildly committed to uh, reinventing themselves every single year are, are, are gonna be those that pull ahead. And those who have people who are hanging on to, well, I have a college degree, um, they're, they're gonna be toast because the world is just changing so fast right now. And so part of culture and the magic of it right now is how do we get people inspired to go read that book, listen to that podcast, learn a new trick, um, and bring that into the organization as opposed to regurgitating yesterday's knowledge. You know, the old the old saying about uh, do they have 30 years of experience? No, they have one year of experience repeated 30 times. You know, we can't do that anymore. We have to have learning organizations. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, sandbox etiquette. I, I, um, you know, as as you know, we're you know, everyone full disclosure, we're a client. Uh, the sandbox etiquette, which is part of the thank thank God it's Monday interface. Um, I have enjoyed that immensely. It's, uh, and I, in fact, I think if we did nothing else but just 
watch the videos, work through it, think about it, talk about it, reinforce how we treat each other, how we call each other out when things aren't going well, keep each other on track, and, and being um, being uh, you know probably being authentic is probably the best way to you know to put it in, in many cases. But the sandbox etiquette um, is fantastic, and uh, you know certainly there's a lot of things that we're all guilty of. I mean, as you go through there, you you discuss or you discover, hey, I know I'm doing that this on this given day or on that given week, or I have a tendency to do that in my management style. Um, so I just want to thank you for that because I I think that. Uh, in fact, I, I should send that to my kids, by the way, for the sandbox etiquette, have them read it or, or, or watch the videos because I think it'd be very helpful. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, I'll get into kind of the next topic. There's a lot of political rhetoric these days. And, um, and, and, and this is not about politics, but I will say that we, we've seen we've seen a lot of folks rip off the uh, the band aid and be really harsh with each other. Um, social media allows for that. I mean, you see things get said on social media that that otherwise they wouldn't say in person because they'd be fearful of the of of the comment or the response from the, the person. Um, but and that's finding its way into the workplace a little bit. Um, and I find that very interesting uh, that that people are willing to say and do the things and treat each other the way that they that they are. And I would I would love to hear your thoughts and comments around that because it's it seems to be permeating. It's not a cultural thing. It's not like I'm getting too old. I mean, I look at things on Facebook and Instagram and all the rest of it. Not a big social media guy. I use it for to make my life more efficient and and uh, and easier. But it seems to do an awful lot of damage at times. So listen. So you're in Michigan. I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. Our mama sat us down and taught us, um, and, and our fathers had even louder voices about this. About grow up to be a good human being and there are no exceptions to those things and and no you don't say those kind of things you say it this way and so that was part of of a, of a learning that seems to have fallen away and and social media has now allowed this vicious flesh ripping commentaries that people are making and, and it seems to be allowed and my fear is when that and not, not if but when that comes into the workplace you know, um, you can't take back words. And so when someone says something like that, it, it doesn't go away. And so, and that's why we're always teaching people, bring your highest and best self to work. Yes, I know I'm at a Ray today because he did something and I didn't like it, um, but that does not give me permission to bring my lower self in and start ripping and shredding and, and gossiping and rolling my eyes and, and whining and complaining to everybody as opposed to bringing a solution. Um, that's not going to help the situation at all. And so I, I, I think, you know, I love that we're doing the quarterly reviews that hold everybody to the behaviors of values uh, because they're they're hearing constantly and they need that, right? They need to know, am I in alignment? Am I in alignment? Because once they get away with it for one quarter, by the next quarter, it gets pretty ugly. And by the third quarter, it is out of control. And this person's just being a lunatic and creating a lot of problems uh, within the organization. So that tool alone of holding people to the behaviors of the, of the values that you stand for. Is if you ask them, Ray, do you live the values? Oh, yes, I'm honest. Oh, yes, I'm ethical. Oh, yes, I'm, um, I, I do excellence in my work. Oh, yeah, all those things. But then when you start bringing it down to what matters in terms of observed behaviors, mm, do I come to work on um, time uh, with a smile on my face? Mm, no, I'm pretty growly most of the time. Uh, you know, do I only use advancing language, advanced situation? No, if I like something, I complain to somebody who can't do something about it. Well, that doesn't serve the organization and we really have no time for nonsense right now. I think we're going to go through some interesting uh, um, challenging times uh, in the future. And I think uh, those organizations that are intolerable of the nonsense, uh, because, you know, during good times, right? 37% of an average manager's day was spent dealing with dysfunctional behaviors and low performance. What about taking care of customers, right? You know, <laughs> because look at the yeah. time it's wasted yeah. there. Um, and so we've allowed things that we can't allow. And and um, I want to give everybody some peace of mind by telling you a quick story um, that in, in case you have somebody who's really, like really disruptive to your organization. I had a CEO years ago and he called me and he said, I, uh, you're, I know you're coming in next week, but I just let go my top three producers um, because they just have a bad attitude. And I, and I said, well, what percentage of the... Uh, the, the revenue are they responsible for 60% I'm thinking, well, I believe I wouldn't have done that, um, but it was too late. They were gone. And I will tell you that organization doubled their profitabilities that next year. Everybody started shining. They just needed the nasty humans out of the way. Um, and so I just think we got to get nasty humans out faster. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you know, so you identify, let's say that you want to take culture into a new direction or a better direction. And you 
you know, but you're but you're worried about retaining all these employees because you can't, you know, can't upset the apple cart, can't flip over the bus too much and lo lose everybody at once. Advice, if you have advice for, you know, the, the a process that you would take, you know, you take management through or CEO through yeah. is that how you do that? Yes. Yeah, so, so if any of you have a board of directors or you're keeping statistics and you're looking at retention, I, I urge you to change the way you measure that. I think you should look at retention of desirable employees. So if someone's a stinker um, and they're raising a lot of uh, uh, trouble or if they're not performing and they leave, that's not that, that that's a good thing. And, and so don't don't knock that particular piece down. And so you do want to be looking at your um, turnover of good people because that's the stuff that hurts you but but i will I, I have found that many of our organizations have half the number of employees with the same amount of revenue or twice the amount of revenue uh, uh with the same number of employees uh, just because people get about business um, when they don't have all this disruption this disruptive stuff and and i think part of it you know and Ray, i want to give them some real tangible things they can take home and apply right away you know part of it is find something to teach them that's new and then measure it and, and make a big deal and high five them, make sure they're educated about how they do it, move a needle up, throw a big party, you know, uh, when I say big party, like maybe some pizza or some ice cream or something comes in the door because they did something well, high five and then build another one. And so build, be thoughtfully building successes within your organization because most of us are just moving along day in, day out. Uh, just like move, moving my stuff from my left side of my desk to my right side of the desk, and and um, and, and we kind of lose ourselves uh, in that. But you know, Ray, I, I don't know how big you are about sports, but I know a lot of people get pretty enthusiastic about watching sports on the weekend. How sure. fun would that game be if if nobody kept kept the score? Uh, and yet, many businesses are operating <laughs> just that way. They have no scoreboard. They have no lines in the road that says, "Oh, you just went over that line." No, we don't gossip about other people in this organization. Oh, no, we don't. Uh, if we blow it, we don't give our excuse. We tell what we're going to do to get back on track. That's all we really care about uh, is a is a oops. I know this is a problem for everybody. My apologies. Here's what I'm doing. Not here's my sad, sad, sad story. Don't you all feel sorry for me? And and so you know we 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 need to show them how to win and get some wins because people lack confidence universally, um, and you create a better culture when you raise confidence. And here's the thing. You're going to have to teach your people a lot of new tricks over the next couple of years because it's not the same world it was. And so many of them will have to be at least twice as effective um, at what they're doing. Some will have to be doing completely different things. Um, and that's culture, too, because how quickly can you adapt really matters now. Yeah, I, I, I well, we've seen that in spades here in the last uh, 12, 14 months. And, and I think we're going to continue to see that. We've seen that with technology advancements in our business, uh, cybersecurity, fraud detection, uh, making sure we're keeping our customers' money safe, all the rest of that, um, and you know, staying one step ahead of the of the of the. Uh, you know, you've got people outside. You got these barbarians at the gate that are trying to impact your business, um, but you've got people inside that mm -hmm. that that are really not pulling in the same direction. It may have been you. I'm, I'm trying to remember this visual, where you've got your management team uh, pulling um, uh, like a wagon, a little red wagon. Right, and this, maybe you know this one, but it was the you know you've got this small group of people pulling the wagon. You've got a bunch of people that sit in the wagon, and then you've got some people that are pulling the wagon in the opposite direction. Any percent? I mean, I know you look at it. You guys do a lot of surveys, and you'll do a lot of statistics. Uh, can you fill that in the blanks on that? Are you are you familiar with the illustration I'm referring to? Yeah, I, yes, I am. Um, typically, somewhere around 11% of the population from year in year out from the from the decades that I've been watching this data. Are considered to be actively disengaged. In other words, they're working harder against you than for you. Listen, I don't care if they have the keys to the vault. There is no place for them um, that it, you know. They, they just plain have to go. They are risk. As a small business, um, I've, I've had this business for 31 years. Um, prior to that, I um, had the great honor of doing what Ray does. Um, and um, and so um, and in 31 years, um, what, you know. Like not many businesses make it 31 years. I'm sure that a lot of people who are on the line today are those who have been around for a while. You must mitigate risks. So what are your risks? Your risks are employees that will undermine you. Mm -hmm. Your risks are fraud right now. And by the way, I really applaud Ray and his team and what they're doing for fraud. I have a friend who used to be an operations manager in a bank that just had her, her uh, personal and her business account wiped out to zero overnight. This stuff's real, and if, and if you think, oh, that you know, I'm too busy, I don't have time to really work with the bank to figure out how to get better at that. You know, kind of busy. Um, 
you, you, I can't think of anything more important um, than, than making sure you have the appropriate, everything you can, you know, you can never be buttoned down completely because some guy in some other country working in his, his boxer shorts is, is busy trying to find a new way um, to disrupt and to defraud your business. And your bank account, um, and and but there are some ways that they do it consistently. You better know what those are. Better be buttoned down um, as well. So I know we're all from culture here, but hey, it's a bad day. We need to tell all of your employees that they don't get paid because there's no money for payroll because you had your your account wiped out. And so uh, important, we important we've had that happen to small business customers locally. That uh, and we've worked through that. Uh, you know, it's like you know, kind of back back to the culture element. We do a lot of uh, a lot of testing here. It's just. It's, you know, we're trying to get people to click on emails they shouldn't click on and, and try to train them, but it's part of the culture, right? It's read something, identify it, understand that it's a risk. And it's a big cultural shift as you try to work, you know, people through that you can't trust every bit of communication that comes to you, even if it looks like it comes from the CEO or from the customer, you really got to think about it. And to get them to do that, it, we're still finding you know, a certain percentage of people aren't looking at that. And, and maybe that's the same group of people who are trying to pull the wagon in the opposite direction. Who knows? But yeah. uh, well, I, I applaud your bank and the good work you're doing for your community to keep your small businesses informed because a lot of banks, they're just doing transactional banking. You're doing transformational banking. You're committed to those small businesses. And so um, uh, and that's why community banking banks exist is to keep the communities thriving. And you do an excellent job of that. Right? Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, all right, let's talk a little more. I, I kind of made the, the the reference earlier to the happy bus or the, you know, there's the Jim Collins, you know, there's the, you know, the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. But, you know, it, it what sometimes what we worry about is we're trying to um, install a culture of accountability. And, it you know, and that's being a little more authentic and sincere and providing, you know, the correct feedback, the right feedback. Of course, you've got to use it, you know, kind of advancing language, be, be nice, be cordial, but, but talk a little bit about that process of working through that as you start to build that authentic culture with each other and really make sure everybody feels valued. But part of feeling valued is being honest with each other, right? I mean, at least that seems to be part of it. Yes, we call it calling it tight. And calling it tight doesn't mean, aha, Ray, I'm calling it tight. You violated this rule or this whatever. Uh, it, but it, it means you call it tight. As it happens, if you, if you see it, you say it. Um, and, and so you, so when you see something that isn't done correctly, or doesn't meet the excellent standards of the organization, or doesn't meet the, the values of the organization, that everyone in the organization should speak up at that at point. And that's a healthy culture when you get to that particular place. Now, there's, there's a new phenomenon out there um, and that I'm sure everybody is seeing, uh, which, which is um, that whole, I'm offended. Um, everybody's offended by everything. And, and, and it's kind of, um, you know, there, there's a real rule of life calling. You can't be offended. Um, nobody can offend you. Uh, being offended is a choice. Uh, it's just that somebody has a different opinion. Okay, so let's talk through it like adults. And so teaching your team members how to listen to each other and hear and realize that it's okay to have different opinions. Um, there was a great quote I shared with the CEO group this last Friday. I don't think you saw it um, um, about um, how you know many people right now are getting so rigid and and so and they have a belief system and they're unwilling to look at anything new because they have that belief system and that's that's the it. And there are others who who basically see it differently and they want to have a discussion about it and they want to understand and they and there's an open discussion. That's what we need to create within our workplaces. It's not being modeled out there in the real world is the problem. And so people are are seeing, no, I disagree with you. I don't even want to hear it. Um, and and that you can't have a healthy organization with that kind of an attitude going on. Yeah, you know, I, 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 um, a lot of it happens politically, but you see this lack of tolerance mm -hmm. uh, for different opinions and viewpoints. And it's uh, it's certainly very challenging. I mean, I mean, some of your earlier comments sound a little bit like marriage, you know, marriage counseling, you know, just kind of, being authentic, talking to each other, and and saying what's on your mind, and, and I wouldn't say refuse to be offended, but you, you get to choose what you're offended about, and uh, is and and I think that's an important um, an important point, especially as you're working through that that process of uh, really holding your your staff, your employees accountable. If they said they were going to do something, and, and as we've started to work through, you know, using some of the systems you have in place. Um, not talking about the things that are really on track and going well, talking about the things that aren't going well mm -hmm. and, and focusing your energy on how do you, and, and, and then how do you get it back on track? 
Yes. That's that accountability piece that I've enjoyed quite a bit here in the last, we've been doing this, you know, for well, almost about a year now, but but more, more um, I would say more intently and uh, focused on that here in the last 90 days. Maybe talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, that that's so necessary because if we just sit and watch everybody not doing everything correctly, we, we can see where this is going to go. This business will not survive. So we have to get to that place and, and right, you know, there are some inherent problems in that as we do emotional intelligence testing, we find out that we have many people who have like low self uh, view scores, for instance, um, or high adherence organization scores. And I'll just tell you what that language means. It's either it's either that I feel crushed um, that you see that differently than I do, because therefore I must not be okay, uh, is a low self view score in emotional intelligence and a high adherence organization score is. I know everything. I got everything. How dare you be have a different opinion? You're wrong. Um, and, and so if you have a combination of those two, it's really hard to get through to some of those folks about, hey, there's another way to see this and we need you to do it this differently and don't be crushed by the fact that we're asking you to do it differently because it's just in their bones. Um, emotional intelligence is the leading indicator of future growth uh, is, is the um, is the leading indicator of whether something will do well in their job uh, a high, higher than IQ. Um, and so, but if somebody doesn't naturally have the emotional intelligence, we have to help them develop it. And if it's not naturally in them, it becomes a bigger problem. Um, but, but that, so that's what Bray's talking about is like, how do we get people to have those conversations and normalize it and kind of go, oh, I just talked to Mary and I uh, vehemently disagreed with how she did that particular piece. And I brought it up in a way that was using advancing language. And I said, hey, I think I see a better way to do it. Um, and maybe I'm missing something, um, but what, what if we did it this way instead? And Mary went, okay, well, that that's interesting. Thanks for sharing it. Here's why I did it that way. Oh, okay, I learned something. I think we need to do that part of this, but could we do this part? Oh, great, great, we can, we can agree together. That's how grownups should be talking together in the workplace. It's not the norm, sadly. Um, and so that's why we have to model it teach it, give lots of education about it, reinforce it when we see it. And if somebody just plain can't do it and they become an obstructionist, we have to deal with that as well. Yeah, we've um, we've certainly had to cope with that. Um, um, you know, at the, you know, the bank, we've got folks that are used to doing a job a certain way and things change materially and we need them to think about the job differently or approach it differently. And, you know, they just don't want to. And that job, you know, the job doesn't require that skill set anymore, right? It mm -hmm. requires a different set of skills. Right. And it's it's challenging uh, as, we, as we go through that process. Certainly, um, you know, uh, re-onboarding someone that's already been with you 20 years can be very tricky. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, if, I, if I'm a small business owner, and small businesses, you know, that, that could be, you know, the way that the way the government and other people describe that, you know, that could be 50 million and under in sales or 100. That, that's our whole customer base. That's all we work with for, you know, for the most part. Um, are there some are there some simple steps or things to think through knowing that you've identified, hey, I've got a culture that's not working. Like for us in particular, you know, we started with, you know, where, where everyone feels valued, you know, and what does that mean? That it means an awful lot when you start to work through that process. And it's mm -hmm. not just customers, it's also employees. But mm -hmm. in this case, we're talking about culture. We do know that if you if you can you can work on your internal culture, the external culture with the customers is even easier for them to understand why they want to do business with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so some like some simple framework or ideas to think about for if I'm the small business owner and I, I know I need to change my culture, I, I need to remain relevant and competitive some ideas or framework for, for them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about several different things. Um, one of them is you, you talk about like re-onboarding people. I, I believe, and we, we call it the kick butt kickoff where we come in and it's basically, okay, everybody, days of first day of, of forever and, for, and um, no guilt and shame for the way you behave in the past. Um, that is forgiven, that is forgotten going forward. We're gonna make some agreements about how we're gonna work together. And so defining the agreements of, that you're gonna live by are very, very important. Um, so um, let me give you a couple examples of an agreement. Um, an agreement is if I disagree with Ray, I'm going to I'm going to go talk to him. We call it the sundown rule. I, I'm going to go uh, uh, express my opinions and thoughts with Ray before the sun goes down. Um, but I'm also going not to just have his head and, and, and let him know how wrong he is, but I'm going with an open heart to kind of go, hey, there's probably two different ways and maybe I'm missing something um, and, and to go there. And that and that's why, you know, one of the other ground rules has to be uh, if you got a problem in the organization or you got a concern, 
bring bring it up or bring it directly to the person, but never to somebody else who can't do something about. It. That's called whining. That's called gossip. That will that will erode your souls of your people. They will hate coming to work every day. They can't get over that. It's not a safe work environment. And so you got to put a line in the sand about these things. And if somebody violates, it's like, hey, we talked about this. This can't happen again. I think another uh, uh, suggestion I would have is when you're doing interviews and like every bad hire I've ever had, my business was a result of one of my managers not following the hiring system. Um, and so it's like, and then they'll come, oh yeah, I really like so-and-so. Well, great. Um, and, you know, show me the scores on this and show me the scores on that. And what'd you do here? And what'd you do there? Uh, they bypass that because they were busy and that person's probably going to get another job offer. So, and so ask questions that, that get to, um, to, to, that get them to reveal to you how they tend to do things as it applies to the values of the organization. Let's say that you would disagree with Ray and he's the CEO, scary dude, because he's got the fancy title. He's not so scary though. He's like a real guy. Uh, it's just that he seems scary right now because he's the CEO. Uh, and so what, you know, how, how have you handled that in the past when you, when you've disagreed with the CEO? And if they say, well, I talked to everybody about it and, and I, you know, gosh, we, there's a whole group of us. We talk at night, we all go to the, the bar together and discuss it. Well, now, you know, somebody who has a very strong pattern of very dysfunctional behavior. Yeah, it's a uh, good advice. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the important takeaway is that culture is important. Uh, there's no time like the present to start to address it and, and work through that, uh, together and, uh, and, and start taking those steps. And certainly that good communication is the underpinning of all of that. Uh, certainly working for us. Uh, we've been in business since 1898, you know, and uh, uh, I'm not, you know, I, I would say that uh, um, we always have to reinvent our culture to remain relevant and remain competitive. And for community banks in particular to remain independent, uh, we have shareholders, we have customers and our jobs to make everybody happy all the time. But but as, as important as anything is onboarding and bringing people into your culture and making sure you're paying attention to that, cultivating it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, let's see if we, we have some questions. Um, Sid, do we happen to have any questions at the moment? Yeah, thanks, Ray. We do have a few in the chat here. I'll ask the first one is for Roxanne. How do you handle an us against them mentality within your company or workforce? Okay, well, for anyone who's ever done an acquisition or a merger, that is the disease that, according to research, um, the vast majority, I don't know, well over 80% of, of acquisitions do not meet their financial goals. And it's because we do it this way, those people over there, they don't get it, they're wrong, we're right, we're brilliant, they're stupid, uh, and that becomes the conversation, and it's not healthy. Um, and, and so, uh, at, at, as a leader of the organization, you have to make it clear to your people, we don't do that here. There's just we. Uh, and if you disagree, you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to talk to the person that you're in disagreement with, and you're going to seek to understand what it, why they're doing it the way that they're doing it, and listen, and then go, okay, that's good. Or, or, or uh, are you open to a couple of different ideas about how to do that? And so you work through those particular pieces, but you don't complain to somebody else. So I, I have worked with several organizations through acquisitions, and we have had 100% success rate of them becoming profitable and the culture being good right away. That's not the norm. It's more like 87% or a train wreck for a solid two years. Um, but part of it is getting those agreements. Like, here's how we're going to do it. And then you got to stand by those agreements. You got to let people have to see that you, um, as an ownership team, as an executive team, are like, are, are, are putting some muscle behind this thing and that you mean it and that you're going to address things that aren't there. And if you're one of those people who is built for, I just want everybody to like me. And so I hate conflict, I just shy away from it. Let me assure you, you will have more conflict in the end by not addressing those things. So you, I always say you got to put on your big boy pants and your big girl pants and go after it and have those tough conversations uh, when, when, when people are, are, are going off um, sideways on you. Well, I appreciate that, Roxanne. And there's actually a, a very closely related question in the chat as well. Um, what happens when you begin implementing change and you have some employees that don't buy in? Okay. Um, boy, that's never happened on planet earth. Okay, well, that that is the job of a cultural shift is to create a movement and you're always creating a movement. So let, let's just say, perhaps you're having a movement right now in your organization or need one to be more customer centric and, and more, uh, you know, wake up in the morning, obsess about your customers and how to add value to them and how to make a bigger difference in their lives. Uh, and maybe you got employees who are just there, you know, um, you know, coming in every morning, putting in their hours and walking back out the door. Well, now you got a problem. Um, and so you need to have a cultural movement to get them more obsessed about taking care of customers. 
for many, there will be the need to um, get your, your teams more sales oriented. Um, and because I think as we have more challenging times ahead of us, uh, everybody wants somebody else to bring home the whale uh, and everybody wants to be in the village eating the whale. Well, we, we need more people bringing in the revenue. So to make it, to normalize it, to make it fun to be on a revenue team, to teach them how to do it in a way that they can win better are all some of the things that, that can do. Here's how to not do it, um, uh, and I'll, sit, I'll, I'll say it this way. Um, don't just give them a goal with some incentive and, and then uh, you know, watch a third of them go run out the door because they, they think they'll never hit that goal and they're not feeling good about themselves. Uh, those old belief systems that, uh, well, we'll you know, if we give them the money, the results will follow. It doesn't work that way. The research is clear. Uh, up to a certain level, extrinsic award, uh, rewards matter, in other words, money. Um, after people have their basic needs meet, met, it's all about intrinsic rewards. And so they need to get more education. They need to be better stimulated. They, they need to have high fives. They need to have the group get together and go, woo, we did it all. So um, as, as you guys know, we talked about daily huddles, quarterly celebrations, weekly CEO rater report. These are the methodologies of culture because you need a whole series of cultural systems that just keep going during good times and bad. And I wanna mention that too, is everybody wants to quit things during bad times. And that's when you most in fact need them. Um, so, so you just have to stand, push through that, work through those things um, and, um, and, and work through those things. So, so for those things, people who aren't willing to change, we have to educate them. We have to talk to them about it. Um, and in some cases where they're absolutely unwilling or unable to change, we need to start moving people around. That's why we always talk about the Teal organization because if you have the one guy at the top, and, and, and it's so dramatic, you know, like he stays, he goes, um, that, that's dramatic. Um, and that's very different than having kind of a circular organization where this person's in charge of this piece of that, and this person's in charge of this, and this person's in charge of this, and they run their own teams on each of those. It just creates that fluidity that the people who have been around for a while that are holding you hostage can no longer hold you hostage. <laughs> well, I think this next question is a question everyone probably has. Where's the best place to start when implementing cultural change? Okay. Well, I'll tell you how we always start with an organization. We, we always start off with this thing called a kick butt kickoff, which is we get everybody in the room at the same time and we do a process uh, and it's fun and it's authentic and it's playful uh, and we're building a spirit and we're asking them to uh, uh, create the all of the uh, customer service standards for every moment of truth in the organization and also to create agreements about how they'll be with each other. Now we're orchestrating a lot of it um, because it can obviously go sideways. Um, but I, but I think some 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 variation and some beginning element of that uh, of let's create these things together, then let's hold each other to that. Um, so I think the need now with so many people being remote uh, to pull them together to have these conversations, whether they're virtual. Um, or whether you have them in different rooms or you have a combination, I think people need to get pulled together more for these kinds of discussions, whether you call them a town hall meeting and you have a regular uh, uh, um, example of that. Um, they just need to see that you're on it and you're advancing those things. What resources do you recommend to help an organization make these changes? Uh, okay, well, um, I, I would say, it, uh, right. If you want, we can make available to, to them the emotional intelligence assessments or whatever. You just have to let us know who they want to contact and we'll put them directly in charge with the company that we get them from. Um, I strongly believe in that tool because when people when people are built, you know, if, if somebody's five foot three, you don't put them into a basketball game to, to, to play uh, on the top team. Um, and, and so, um, so many of the testing tools that are out there are interesting but they don't have that necessary correlation to being functional in the workplace so i, I think that's a tool um mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of businesses all over the country and world have told me that they read the thank god's money book together and that um, they take a chapter at a time and they apply the information that's a way to get started too and and so um and maybe somebody on the team at the bank can even lead a book club or something like that to to, to move through um that that could be another way to do it um another way that you could uh, another uh resource uh, probably that's important is to be thinking about setting up quarterly reviews where you tie people to the behaviors of your organizations and also to the results that they get. And, and so and to, to move swiftly toward that, because the old days of a yearly review and its objective are over. Things 
uh, or I'm sorry, wait, subjective are over. Uh, it, it needs to be objective data of here's how I live this um, uh, behavior, and here's the critical driver that I moved to, so I do know how I tie to profit. Um, but I would do them in steps, and I always say stage appropriate accountability. Never, never go flying on the hill ahead of your skis. You're going to have a problem, and so uh, you have people winning first before you make them accountable. I like the, the comment about uh, uh, getting out over your skis. You know, you made a comment earlier, Roxanne. Um, about you know when is a good time to start a process and it's probably probably never a good time but you have to start somewhere uh, because you know a lot of your staff will say well we have this conversion coming up or we have this new software we're going to install or or you know it, there's a pandemic and people need to go work from home so uh and, and that was really our case because we had started down this process and we had a thoughtful discussion um and there were some people that thought maybe we shouldn't uh, work through this overhaul and this, and it's really all about better communication, authentic communication, and finding different ways to do it, and then listening to what your staff is telling you uh, and, and what that what they're valuing. There, there's no good time. We're going to do it now. We're going to get it done. And we're going to stay focused. Turned out, it, it played out very well for us because we had a lot of folks move to that kind of platform during this 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 time period. So I would say. You just got to dig in, regardless of what's going on in the noise, because it's got to be that important. Is that is? Would you agree with that? Uh, exactly. And I worry about the businesses that are waiting for the right time, because what they're really saying is, we just don't think we're going to be very strong ever, um, nor will we make it. Um, we don't believe in ourselves, and so you have to believe in yourself enough to say, <clears throat> I'm scared. I don't know how to do this. Uh, there's a lot to learn, and I'm all in. Let's go. Um, let's get those things done. Perfect. Thank you, Roxanne. I, I wanted to thank you for uh, spending time with us. And, it, and it, when when we do bring you back, because we're going to bring you back, uh, we'll promise not to do it during a snowstorm or the middle of winter, uh, even though you're, you've, 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 you're you're from the, the great state of Wisconsin. Uh, winters in Michigan can be a little different, but uh, thank you for... <laughs> Thank you for I didn't, attending. I didn't bring my coat when I saw the snow coming sideways when I came to visit you, and I was thinking, we're going to go off the road, and I don't even have a coat. So, yes, I, Michigan winters are different. I did yeah. learn. Yeah. yeah, you bet. Well, um, I, I appreciate it. Uh, you, you're spending the time with us, and I, I hope all of our, all the folks that joined us got the benefit, that it, and, and certainly that, that we do and that we continue to work through. Um, once again, thanks for being here, Roxanne, and That's hopefully you'll, you'll get some email and follow-up from some of the folks on the call. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, thank you. And, and good luck. Don't be disheartened wherever you're at. I, I have worked with organizations that were a train wreck uh, in their culture where they were just about ready to have to close the door. It wasn't working that are now some of the top performers in their state and winning the awards as best culture. So it's just a matter of getting the right systems in place. And so don't get disheartened. Thanks so much, Roxanne.